Thanks, Eric. And uh, Mike, thank you for joining us again. Um, I guess to get started, since a lot of the audience here uh, is from other countries work and uh, suppliers or um, organizations working with suppliers, can you give an overview just of the two publications uh, you're with and the audience? And then we'll jump into some of the questions. Uh, yeah, sure. So Progressive Grocer is um, the nation's oldest um, publication, brand, whatever you want to call it, uh, multi-platform uh, type of brand focused on the, the universe of retailers uh, and CPG companies that are involved in the food and consumables space. Uh, was founded in 1922, so it'll be 100 years old next year. Uh, it's, it's fun to go back and look at some of those uh, early issues and see um, what were business challenges back in the 20s, which are essentially some of the same challenges today, but there's just different technologies and different approaches to solving them. So you go from a 100-year-old brand to a 10-year-old brand in Retail Leader, which was kind of a spin out of uh, Progressive Grocer focused on you know, maybe uh, more big picture issues that would be of interest to senior executives in uh, the food and consumables universe. So eh, that's kind of it in a nutshell on the two brands. And then, um, and then Ensemble IQ, of course, has a portfolio of all kinds of different brands covering chain store age, convenience store news, drugstore news, uh, Path to Purchase Institute. So lots going on. Wow, so uh, PG actually launched, what, a couple of years after the pan uh, the Spanish flu wrapped up. <laughs> I know, I know, it's crazy. Like, I I've seen the original issue of the magazine, mm -hmm. which was actually a, a more like a pamphlet back mm -hmm. then. It was like a tabloid right. size right. thing. Small. You could fit in your apron if you were a grocer, you know, like old timey grocer wearing an apron and you, you tuck it in the front of your, of your uh, apron and reference it throughout the day. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, yeah. it's been a crazy year. So can uh, you just give us a high level overview of the state of the industry, what's been happening over the past year from the craziness in March and April through where we are now? Yeah. So as you know, and maybe, but some of the folks listening aren't, aren't as well versed, but uh, it's just been a ridiculously insane year. Um, I know unprecedented is, is the term that uh, tends to be used a lot when people describe what happened. Um, but, you know, like, like Eric said, uh, he and I have worked together for on and off for 20 years. Um, I started back in the early 90s. So I've seen, I've seen a lot of stuff, but nothing, nothing like what we saw this last year. And what I would say specifically about, you know, what we saw this last year uh, if you go back to sort of uh, that March, April, May timeframe, the uh, tremendous surge in sales volume in a pretty mature industry was, was just crazy. So I recall reporting at the time, you know, it was pretty common to see increases of like 25, 40%. Um, you know, a lot of uh, like the digital piece of it, triple digit rates of e-commerce growth were pretty common. I mean, and when I want to say triple digit, I mean like 200, 300%. Mm -hmm. That was a fairly immature, um, you know, some of that, that e-commerce uh, business was a little less developed. So it's easier to get that giant increase on a smaller base, but still uh, quite stunning. And, um, you know, retailers weren't really prepared for that. So there was a lot of, uh, I think the word of the year last year was pivot. Um, there was a lot of pivoting. Um, you know, you've got to stand up, you know, or roll out your e-commerce operation. You've got to, you know, uh, pick and pack orders. You're trying to get technology in place while you're also trying to uh, ensure people are safe and comply with new uh, protocols around social distancing and uh, regulating customer traffic. So <clears throat> all of these sort of like unusual things hitting all at once. Now, um, that's kind of ancient history. So I'm going to you know, maybe skip over that. And this is a fairly long answer, but um, I think it'll all kind of make sense when we, get, when we get closer to the end. But if you, you know, remove that March, April, May period and the, the tremendous spike up and then there was a, a natural fall off because of the 
uh, pantry loading and people were working off inventories and that type of thing. Then you sort of settled into a more normalized but still pretty elevated uh, sales volume level. And there was a general trend toward the um, transaction sizes that were much, much larger, but uh, traffic to stores was down. So basically people buying online, uh, instead of spending a hundred bucks, you know, they're spending 200 and they're swinging through and they're, you know, doing the click and collect uh, type, uh, you know, fulfillment option there. Or, you know, to a lesser extent, I think home delivery was, um, played a big role also. Now, just this morning, so I'm going to throw in a, a current stat. Uh, just this morning, we did see Ajo Delhaye's report their uh, fourth quarter results, and their same store sales were up 11.2%, which normally, you know, 11.2% in a mature industry like food retailing would be pretty stunning, a huge accomplishment, but that's actually down from earlier in the year. So we've seen like a, a gradual tapering off um, although online sales continue to be elevated, their um, online sales were up 128%. So, you know, that's, that's pretty notable. And then um, the other big trend that you're seeing among all types of food retailers is a lot of pressure on um, profits, operating profits and specifics uh, specifically. The, uh, in the case of Ajo, they specifically cited um, significant costs related to COVID-19. Now there wasn't, a, they didn't elaborate on that much, but a lot of those costs are related to, um, you know, safety and sanitation measures. Uh, you know, you're paying people extra money to keep carts clean and, you know, do all of these type of things. Um, and then you've got the labor costs associated with fulfilling orders. And then a, a lot of retailers are paying, and this is true across all types of sectors. Uh, paying appreciation bonuses. Uh, I think that got started back in March and April, um, where there was a lot more uncertainty around, you know, what was going on with the uh, with COVID-19. And so they you saw people kind of, you know, paying a little extra here and there. And then it just, you know, this thing's drug on. So then it just has continued. And so you see, you know, round after round after round of companies in food retailing, but also, you know, you could look at home improvement, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, you know, big increases that they've paid a lot of extra money out over the course of the year. So this is an interesting dynamic also, because then you get into the, uh, you know, what you call that, because it's, the retailers will call it appreciation bonuses. Um, folks on maybe the side more of organized labor have kind of effectively branded those payments as hero pay or hazard pay. Um, and then that's kind of led to now you've seen a lot of cities uh, in the US um, passing ordinances requiring retailers to pay upwards, you know, $4 to $5 an hour, um, you know, temporary increases. So then you're getting another new dynamic here. There's a lot of new dynamics in this crazy world of food retailing this year, but you've got uh, a company like Kroger out West is actually uh, in a couple of cities, uh, Long Beach and Seattle, where they've passed these ordinances. They are actually uh, closing stores, couple in, couple in each city that they've said, you know, they were already underperforming. And so the fact that now they've been uh, handed this increased uh, labor cost that's actually, um, you know, accelerating the demise of those locations. So that's going to be an interesting uh, situation to see how that all unfolds, especially, um, you know, that maybe this is a little more forward looking, but, you know, now we've got a new uh, administration in and what happens with minimum wage and how all of that, you know, plays out in terms of, uh, you know, new cost pressures on an already low margin industry um, that's dealing with sort of these increased costs related to e-commerce coming at the same time as, you know, increased safety and cleaning uh, expense pressures. So that's all, you know, pretty difficult combination if you're an operator. And it's, I think we're gonna see that accelerate adoption of a lot of uh, technology, if you will, especially around automated fulfillment, um, we saw a pretty good ramp up in self-checkout this year. 
but then even even other stuff you know there's a lot of activity around robots um you know roaming the aisles of stores and shelf edge cameras performing uh uh, uh what's the word i'm looking for there the um planogram compliance type activities that type of stuff and so a lot of interesting things to see um i think in the next uh in the next day or two, and then in probably throughout the next month, we're going to we're in for a very very interesting time because uh, we've got more uh, big retailers that are going to be reporting their fourth quarter results. We have Walmart is tomorrow, I know. Um, then you'll have Albertsons and uh, Kroger, and then Target. You know, he heading into March basically, and um, you know I expect we'll see the what we saw with Ahold, where you'll see still elevated sales, and then a lot of the um, growth of digital. Um, <clears throat> it's worth noting, I think, that um, the e-commerce, the elevated e-commerce levels we're seeing is partly due to how those sales are reported. Um, if you kind of look in the fine print on some of the company's um, quarterly results and the footnotes and such, um, in a lot of cases, a order that's placed online that is fulfilled by a store, they lump that in the e-commerce bucket. So it tends to distort that a little bit, even though those are sales that would likely have occurred anyway if the customer went in the store and you know selected the um, products themselves. Except the fact that the retailer is fulfilling it uh, typically means that it's costing them more money. So there is a school of thought that the model currently that's happening with e-commerce is not really sustainable. And that's why I think you're seeing a lot of activity around uh, automated fulfillment. Um, actually, you know, that's, there's a lot of companies in Europe that are looking to get into the U.S. and um, help uh, U.S. companies with that. Cool. So just real quick, I'm um, touching on, you know, what, so what's, what's next? Um, before we went live, Joe and, um, and Eric and I were kind of talking about vaccine stuff. Uh, you know, this is something we spend a lot of time thinking about. You know, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of the, uh, the outbreak here. And, you know, it's everybody wants to know the same thing about, you know, when do we get back to normal? What's normal going to look like? You know, how sticky are some of these new behaviors that shoppers learned? All of this sort of stuff. Because if you ask people, um, it, most most folks, especially the ones that were like new converts to online shopping, they typically say they love it and that they will, you know, want to continue doing it in the future. So, you know, that sets up an interesting situation around, you know, the future of physical stores, you know, what kind of volume the, the physical store does, what, what sort of role they fill as far as like fulfillment of orders. Because, you know, it's not really that efficient to bring a truck to the back door, put the stuff on the shelf, and then use that to pick from, you know. So there's, I think there's a lot of supply chain uh, developments that are coming that uh, we don't fully know what those are all going to be. Um, and this is a subject that gets studied a lot. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, surveys and research out there about, you know, asking shoppers how they expect to behave in the future, mm -hmm. which is very tricky right now because we've, nobody's dealt with anything like this before. So we don't know um, how we might act down the road. And you know, this is just a, a thing, you know, being in the media, you get a lot of research and surveys and some of them are designed to produce a certain type of result. So I'm always a little, I'm probably more skeptical than the average person of data about shopper intent. Um, I did just get a survey that was kind of interesting from a company called Chase Design. Um, it's recent, it was just a couple of days ago. There were a lot of interesting themes they explored in the research and the good sample size, you know, a thousand people. So that's pretty good. The uh, two questions stood out for me. One was, um, what motivates you to shop in person? I thought that was an interesting question. And the answer there, the top answer with 63% of people responding was to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's, that's kind of telling. Like, yeah, I might like uh, grocery pickup or delivery, but 
if people are saying they want to get out of the house, uh, maybe that means they're a little more inclined to when, when it's more practical to do so. You don't have to worry about how dirty the handlebar is on your cart or wearing a mask. You know, no, nope, that's not a lot of fun. Nobody really likes that. So, um, you know, I think that's an interesting uh, nugget. And then the other interesting nugget um, for my money was, and this is the part where can can we really rely on people when they tell us what they are thinking they're going to do in the future? Uh, and the question was, do you plan on shopping in physical stores uh, more in the coming six months or less? And this is a recent survey. So this is people, you know, kind of, they know about the vaccines and all this sort of stuff. 77.5% uh, say more. So, you know, if you want to believe this data, uh, and then the, these two kind of key points here, it would seem to bode well for a return to a more elevated level of shopping in store than, than what we're seeing now. That's, that's my take on it. But we'll see. There's a lot yet to happen with vaccines. Um, we know people want to stay safe. Um, you know, we, um, we've seen a lot of activities around the whole, you know, all the masks and hygiene barriers in stores. And you know, some of this stuff has worked. Some of it's not worked so well. I think it's, I think retailers found it very challenging to regulate store traffic. And, uh, you know, where I'm at here in Florida, I've been in some very, very crowded stores and uh, it feels a little weird. You know, uh, everybody's got a mask on and there's a lot of signs but um, they seem to, the retailers in my state anyway, seem to like not really, uh, uh, not adhere to that goal of sort of limiting the number of people in the building, if you will. Um, and so I think safety is gonna be a, a huge factor, you know, even, even uh, once hundreds of millions of people in the United States have been vaccinated, I think safety will still be paramount. Um, there was another interesting little nugget this morning, a company called Ecolab. Some of you may know Ecolab, big uh, safety um, sanitation type of company. They have a program here. I'm looking for the name of it. It's called uh, Ecolab Science Certified. And so they just signed up uh, Ingalls Market, Brookshires, Cub, Coborns, Bristol Farms, and Lazy Acres to be part of their science certified program, which is basically a customer facing type of thing that, that um, you know, it's a, it's a method to let shoppers know that you've complied with these rigorous standards that Ecolab has developed to ensure safety and security. So just to kind of summarize, um, this was like more than an actual answer to that first question, Joe, but just to summarize, um, and kind of maybe look ahead a little bit and kind of that'll tee things up for us, us to have a conversation. But um, food retailers are in for, I think, what's going to be a interesting and challenging first quarter, mainly because they're lapping those comparisons to prior year when they had, you know, 30, 40% gains. Uh, I, I know some analysts are forecasting food retailer sales are actually going to decline because they won't be able to compare, um, you know, you can't uh, comp on top of 40%. So that's uh, super difficult. And then we're also seeing, you know, restaurants are, are coming back, um, reopening, doing more carry out. And so a lot of that displaced demand that drove those huge gains throughout 2020, as the, you know, the pendulum swings back with food service operators re resuming sort of a more normalized environment, some of that natural, um, that shift that occurred, you know, the, the tide will go back out a little bit um, and then and then we'll see what happens. But, um, you know, people learned a lot of new behaviors um, including cooking at home, you know, so there's been a lot of research done on that, that uh, people, you know, like cooking at home, they think their food's pretty decent. so. You know, if you think about these two big buckets of, of ways that shoppers or consumers satisfy, you know, their, their, their eating needs, um, the food retail, the, the food service companies have, I think, their work cut out for them 
to get people to come back and dine in and the food retailers are going to, you know, fight like hell to hang on to that, you know, and they've, they have their own food service operations. So I'll quit, uh, quit rambling, I guess, Joe, and maybe we can talk. No, a not bit at all. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a uh, follow-up question for you. You, when you talked a little bit earlier about how the shopping, the shoppers have changed their shopping patterns, right? They're buying online, they're buying more when they go into the store. Have they also been seeking other channels? For instance, um, two weeks ago, we had our convenience program and I interviewed a bunch of buyers and they were mentioning that one thing they've seen was a surge of consumers who did not want to wait online or the crowds of the grocery store and they were buying their staples at the convenience stores and the convenience stores had to kind of change their product, their assortment to reflect that. And I'm an example of that too. When uh, COVID started and the grocery stores had lines out the door, I switched to my little natural organic store around the corner and I haven't stopped shopping there since, even though, you know, it's, it's loosened up a little bit. Well, what are you hearing in that respect? Yeah, so that's that's, that's interesting. I, I think that gets into the larger conversation about what is a channel anymore, mm -hmm. because you know you and I've been in the industry a while. It used to be a very clear distinction between a drugstore, a supermarket, mass retailer, and it's incredibly blurry now. Mm -hmm. I think what your your point about buying those side of staples at a convenience store that makes sense if that convenience store actually had those type of products and replenishes them. You know the the whole supply chain is a little different with convenience stores and then the mix of stuff that they have. Um, you know, there's, there are some food supermarkets that are smaller than convenience stores up. The example I'm going to use is uh, if you know, this chain Bucky's uh, they are, you know, they have a hundred fuel fueling stations and their building is 50,000 square feet. They're opening one in St. Augustine, Florida. And I think February, 28th or 22nd. Well, I mean, what do you even call that? I mean, mm -hmm. you could look at a chain like a Wawa or a Sheets where they have a very big and uh, Casey's is another example. These C store chains that, uh, you know, they sell gas, but they have a huge food service operation and they, they're doing a ton of delivery. So it kind of comes back to that share of stomach notion mm -hmm. where if you and I are hungry, do, I mean, do we care? Like if I, yeah. I can order prepared food from Kroger or Publix, or I can get prepared food from Wawa or Sheets, or, you know, even, even drugstores, you look at the number of refrigerated and frozen doors in drugstores. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, I mean, you could, you can buy everything you need to make a meal. And then like, we could probably talk also about what, what are called in this country dollar stores, but you know, Dollar General, Family Dollar, that is their number one initiative is to add frozen and refrigerated coolers and freezers and then get into the self-distribution of fresh. So they're becoming a, a grocer, even though they're not typically thought of as that. Yep, yep. And, you know, uh, another interesting point you brought up was the, the data point, because going into this year, it's going to be really difficult for retailers to make an apples to apples comparison within the different categories. You know, they don't know. Uh, again, I was talking to some buyers where they're like, well, we don't know if a product sold well based on its merits or did it just sell well because there was nothing else and consumers were just stocking up. So that's going to make it a big challenge as buyers do their planning going into the next year on exactly what to look at, what data to analyze. Agreed. And I think the, I've had those same conversations with folks and I, and I think what's happening is people are gonna basically skip a year and try to go back and look at the prior year. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard. Like, how do you plan a promotion for the first quarter this year or the second quarter if you're looking at last year's data that's all distorted, you know, mm -hmm. because there wasn't a normalized demand environment so that's very tricky and then the, the the other then you get into the issue of the the skew rationalization that occurred mm -hmm. because you know you're out of stock you want to get back in stock on whatever you know maybe maybe it's tortilla chips and so maybe you don't have 10 flavors you have three flavors 
Mm -hmm. And so now I think CPG companies have to look and like, well, maybe we don't really need all of that. And yeah. so our operations can be streamlined and we can function more profitably. Our supply chain can be more efficient. Um, the other uh, the other issue there was you touched on it is the notion of brand, mm -hmm. uh, private label and brand switching. So I don't know about you, but I, I bought some stuff because I needed it. It wasn't what I normally bought. Mm -hmm. And um, the example I use there is uh, ketchup. Normally I would be, I would buy Heinz ketchup mm -hmm. and uh, you know, but it was all gone. Yeah. And so I ended up buying Hellman's brand ketchup. Which Hellman's is mayonnaise, right? They're not mm -hmm. ketchup, but that's, that's what was there. So yeah. it was yeah. a great opportunity to, for emerging brands to kind of get forced trial Right. on their products and some did well with it and some failed miserably. Uh, I had in a, a local drugstore chain by me, you know, a few months ago, they had in the paper towel section, they had all of these new brands I never heard of before. So I'm like, great. You know, I tried one of them and massive failure. I mean, it pushed the water a spill all over the place. It didn't absorb. So it was a squandered yeah. opportunity. Whereas if, you know, they took advantage of it and had a quality product, you know, so right there, they were just trying to fill the space and, and, and the demand. We, um, we saw that, I think, in toilet paper, mm -hmm. you know, which, because um, toilet paper is a notoriously difficult category to, you know, you use what you use and it works fine. So, you, you know, you don't normally switch, mm -hmm. but, you know, if, if, if Charmin's out and you, you know, you, but Scott is there, then, you know, you need what you need. So, um yeah, a lot of yeah. uh, a lot of interesting dynamics in the uh, in the brand world for sure. Yeah. So and and now uh, you know we want to talk a little bit about the concept of wellness because wellness was a big trend before the pandemic. People are starting to eat healthier, especially younger people. You know, pandemic kind of really accelerated across categories. Uh, and, and we're talking, you know, obviously you have the PPE and 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 all all of those related products, but in terms of people thinking more about longevity and what products they can consume to be healthier and fight off maybe future pandemics. Uh, what trends have you seen in wellness? Like how has that radiated out across categories? Well, I think if you go back and you looked at some of the data from last year on like uh, vitamins, nutritional products, mm -hmm. I think there was a, there was a big surge there. I haven't, I haven't seen anything lately, but I think that's one of those things where it's like, once you develop that habit mm -hmm. of taking nutritional supplements, it, that tends to stick. But I, I've, I haven't seen more recent data than what I would have seen, say last July or August. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, I'm not gonna. I was gonna say, I'm gonna guess that it's still elevated, but I don't, I don't want to make that assumption. But well, one buyer told me, actually, they said immunity supplements are here to stay. They, they, they used to have a rolling, you know, demand around the uh, flu season and, you know, cough and cold season. He's like, now it's just always, always 365. It's going to be here to stay. I, I, the greatest innovation in the nutritional supplement category, which I actually used to cover in 1992 mm -hmm. when I started on Drugstore News, uh, is the development of the gummy vitamins for adults. Mm -hmm. uh, I take vitamins now. I never, I, I didn't, you know, I kind of look forward to taking my vitamin in the morning because I get to chew the little gummy thing and it's sweet, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, in fact, um, the Buyer's Choice Award winner for our recent cough, cold, um, preventative and allergy program last week was a gummy vitamin. Hmm. Again, and and that's I mean my problem with gummy vitamins is just I eat too, more than I need. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been tempted to eat more than that. Hey, you mentioned cough cold. That's an there's an interesting situation going on there with cough cold, where you know we used to we used to characterize the cough cold season as a, it was a good season if you know a lot of people got sick and then there was a lot of sales of products. But we've had kind of the opposite of that mm -hmm. this year because social distancing, everybody's trying to stay clean. Mm -hmm flu season, you know, flu infections are down and people aren't buying cough cold products is my understanding. Yeah. And in fact, they stocked up on them like I did in March of last year. 
and they still have all of them on their shelves, uh, as I do. I have, they're all, you know, still have the shrink wrap on them. I have not touched them uh, since. But, you know, I know for me, and I, maybe you, you're seeing this too, but for me, I've had a bigger focus on organic products or free from products of all, you know, everything I get now is organic. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to eat much healthier and live much healthier. So any products that are associated with that are, uh, are big on my list. Yeah, I think that's true. But then I like indulgent type products, you know, like human nature, you know, we're going to keep eating chocolate and cheeseburgers yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, people talk health and then when they shop, it's yeah. indulgent. Yeah, so we're, we have good intentions, right? We have good intentions, um, you know, so. Yeah, and uh, just to let everybody know, I see your questions coming in. So we will be getting to those questions uh, probably in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, so keep them coming. <laughs> so uh, last year, right, in addition to the pandemic, we had a lot of social issues and that spurred on well it just again accelerated people's interest in supplier diversity sustainability you know what's good for the people what's good for the planet um how have you seen those events of last year kind of impact those and, and where does sustainability kind of uh where is retail at with sustainability because i see a lot of retailers are really putting out some good big sustainability goals in the coming years yeah i mean so sustainability i think has been it's taken on a more expansive meaning i think um you know 15 years ago like if you heard somebody talk about sustainability it tended to be around environmental mm -hmm. issues you know it's like oh we're going to use you know, we, we've got uh, fuel efficient trucks or we're going to recycle more corrugate at the store level. No, it was that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Now I think sustainability has become this all encompassing term. Mm -hmm. It includes all of those, you know, social aspects. Um, and then especially like a lot of the stuff we saw this last year, mm -hmm. where I think a lot of companies had programs in place. They never you know, they didn't talk about them much. They, you know, this is, the, this is the thing about the retail industry. And we're working on some interesting projects around this at Progressive Grocer. Retailers in general, I, I mean, I'm going to look beyond just food, do a lot of great things in their communities. And, you know, they never get much credit for it. Um, they spend a lot of money. They, they you know, do interesting programs, a lot of unique type of things, trying to make a difference in the lives of people, just beyond just selling products to folks in the immediate trading area. And <clears throat> I think um, what you've seen this last year is people now like have gotten a lot more vocal about it. And, um, you know, people are kind of waking up to like all the good things that retailers do. And then they've layered on top of that more things and bold pronouncements about big funding commitments to different programs. And I mean, it's, you can Google it. I mean, it's everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. And then the supplier diversity um, issue, you know, and I've got a lot of history with say, mainly like with uh, Walmart and Target and early on some of the programs that they were, they were doing, but I mean, I don't know of a major retailer that didn't already have some kind of program focused mm -hmm. on uh, securing products from a more diverse supplier base, but I think it's really ratcheted up. And I know like you guys do a number of interesting events with like specific retailers mm -hmm. where, cause like they're reaching out to you or you're reaching out to them. I don't know how it comes about, but prime, you know, really focused on driving that. So that's great to see. Um, it's, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody knows this better than ECRM, how hard it is to navigate the, the buying infrastructure at a major retailer and deal with all of the, the challenges of, you know, who do I get to, you know, what are the requirements, all of, all of those sort of things. And now if you're a, if you're a, 
in one of these sort of like historically disadvantaged groups, it's doubly hard. So, you know, hats off to you guys for like doing those kind of programs that help, you know, help move the ball. Yeah, we've had a few, uh, both on a supply diversity uh, side where uh, we've uh, teamed up. Uh, ECRM and Range Me worked with, for example, Meyer and uh, Schnook Markets to launch their supply, first supply diversity initiatives. And we've done a bunch with several others over the years. And then we do have a sustainability, uh, sustainable and eco-friendly packaging session coming up. Okay. And again, it's all driven by the demand of the uh, retailers that we work with, looking to get a little more visibility and looking to source more of these types of products that, that address those social and, and uh, sustainable needs. I feel like we ran we ran articles when you guys did things mm -hmm. with Walgreens and I want to say Dollar General. Yep. Yep. Do We've been doing okay. those for several years, actually. Okay. Yeah, they were the first ones that I think we worked with. So, and, and another thing that I think is in line with the sustainability and these different social uh, um, responsibility causes is at the product level, the importance of certifications. That's something I know us and, and Range Me have been doing a lot of content around uh, was that, you know, th these certifications help the suppliers to be a little more transparent to the consumer when they're, and, and to, mm -hmm. the, to the buyers as well when they're shopping and, and looking for a specific type of product that matches their values. Right. Is that something that, that, uh, that you've seen um, uh, in your heard in your conversations with uh, retailers? I mean, I, I just, you know, build on the last comment. I mean, I think there's a lot of companies and it's hard to, it's hard to know who's actually doing what, because some mm -hmm. of that stuff happens in the, in the bowels of the merchant organization. And, you know, unless there's a big announcement about it or they formalize it with you guys and mm -hmm. do sort of like an open call, you know, like we, we've been involved with a few companies like trying to help them publicize, like, hey, we're doing this, you know, trying to get the word out, and, mm -hmm. you know, facilitate that. Gotcha. All right. Well, we are going to uh, dig into the Q&A because we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, we have a couple of questions here uh, and, and by all means, continue submitting them uh, while we're talking. Uh, one of the um, audience members asked, if you can talk about the trend towards retail media networks. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting trend, isn't it? It's, um, it's a trend, but it's ironically, it's not a, it's not a new trend. Um, you, you go back to the late nineties, you know, remember when a lot of retailers were putting TV screens in stores. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to sell ads on a closed network in a store. Uh, they would put screens at the checkout mm -hmm. because, you know, it would minimize the shopper's perception of how long they were waiting in line and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, you, you, had, you had that. And then now you've got, as retailers are doing more digital, they've got their own, you know, universe of, uh, you know, they've got their own audience mm -hmm. that then they can look to monetize. Let's be honest, right? So yep. they, it's, you know, you can, you want to run in the circular that goes to everybody or you want to engage uh, digitally and tap into like a more targeted approach. So, you know, I know Joe's trying to eat healthier and he's part of my loyalty program. So, you know, if you're a, a plant-based burger company you know, I can serve uh, messages directly to Joe, you know, that kind of thing. So that's gained the, it was gaining traction, but then the shift this last year, I think caused it to gain tremendous traction where it doesn't, you don't have to be Walmart and Target and Kroger and um, Albertsons to have your own network. Even like the end, even like a single store operator, uh, food retailer, because you can join part of a larger group and you know you can tap into some of those supplier dollars too mm -hmm. so 
I think there's a big shift happening and we're gonna see that play out in the coming years as more and more people engage digitally with grocers mm -hmm. and especially with loyalty programs. Cause it, you know, it seems like a lot of folks are standing up these uh, Amazon like programs where, you know, you pay a fee and you got the Walmart plus program. Mm -hmm. Yep. You've got the, so I mentioned Ahold earlier, their giant store. They've got a, I forget what the name of it is. I have to look that up, but it's a, it's the same concept. It's a membership mm -hmm. program and you get in that, that ecosystem and then it's great. You know, it's great for marketers. They can spend less and be more effective with their ad dollars, mm -hmm. you know, working directly with the retailers as opposed to sort of this shotgun approach where you're hitting the whole market. Yeah, well, I know for me, when I'm waiting online at a store, you know, my head is down on my phone. So, I yeah. mean, if there's any way to, which is an, another question, you know, that we have. So it's a good a segue into that is, you know, what about the importance of social media for retailers and brands and, you know, engaging customers that way, especially now with less people, you know, the whole shopping journey is... You know, there's so much digital at the front of it and there's less opportunities for promotions in the stores or people are looking to get in and out of the stores quick when they're there. So it's uh, you got to catch them early. You know, what are you seeing in the digital media, digital marketing realm as far as social media? Okay, that's too broad of a question. I think because uh, it's like, what did you see five minutes ago? I mean, there's like some new thing mm -hmm. five minutes from now. Yep. There's just tremendous innovation happening there, a ton of creativity, because, you know, social media is a blank canvas. You can just do all kinds of innovative stuff. Mm -hmm. You're only limited by, you know, how creative you want to be with, um, you know, a, a campaign or a promotion. I think there's some basics that, that CPG companies or, or, you know, any supplier has to, like, be pretty vigilant about keeping an eye on on traffic about their, uh, comp, you know, who's saying what about their brand, mm -hmm. you got to be ready to jump in there because if you let that go, next thing you know, this something has swelled up and you're, and you're seeing it like a week later, it's probably, you know, you might've missed the boat. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I see that a lot with brands, um, especially when it comes to reviews, you know, where somebody reviewed a product and they might've had a great review on a product or they had something bad to say. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see somebody on the social team from a big uh, CPG company jumping in there and saying, oh, Joe, we're so glad you like the, uh, the plant-based burgers that you bought recently, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Versus, or, or if you had a horrible review of it, you know, it didn't taste like meat at all, you know, then they, they chime in and, you know, I think people react to that. They like to see the brands engaged. Mm -hmm. Definitely, except I'm a grass-fed beef guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a beverage-related question from somebody. Um, what are the opportunities that COVID has caused in the beverage category in the USA? And as a new brand, what should be the points that should be focused on more? Hmm. Bev like, I guess it kind of depends on the type of beverage. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if it's yeah, there's no details there. Yeah, but, I mean, if you're yeah. talking about carbonated soft drinks, that's obviously challenging. But if mm -hmm. you're alcoholic beverage and it's like you're in the hot segment, you know, you're a, yeah. a cider or a, a seltzer brand or, you know, some of these like <clears throat> like I, I don't even know what some of these uh, alcoholic beverage products are anymore. Because, you know, if you grew up kind of like, you know, you had beer and then you had light beer. Yeah. And now it's, you know, you've got all these other variants and it, it's a little tricky. And I've got to believe it's a little tricky for, for the consumer sometimes to understand what's what. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a, that's a challenge. I think, you know, I can't really answer that quite the way I maybe would like without knowing yeah. like beverages. I mean, I could jump in a little bit for that one because we recently had our beverage program and I know, well, like, like you mentioned, alcoholic beverages, we're doing fine. You know, people are stuck at home. So if it's an alcoholic beverage, I mean, uh, uh, addressing that off premise, you know, that person who's going to be drinking at home with all kinds of solutions that whether it's uh, uh, 
cocktail kind of recipes and things like that. That's been pretty big. In the reg regular beverage space, I know anything health related, functional beverages, uh, whether it's uh, uh, or whether it's organic beverages or like you know a coconut beverage or aloe vera. Be I mean, there's so many different types, but anything that's focusing on health um, has been a very big uh, trend. Yeah. No, that's yeah. You're better equipped to answer that than me because there's, um, I mean, there's so there's so much going on and there's a lot of fragmentation of beverage types. I think you, you know, if if I'm a retailer, I'm looking at that and you're know, trying to figure out what's my optimal assortment look like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you've got to you've got to design that by store based on the demographics of the areas that you're at and that type of thing. So. Plant-based, okay. uh, plant-based milks. I know that's like the dairy category is not what it used to be. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. With, I mean, there's all kinds of different milks, you know, plant-based is very hot. I mean, we launched our plant-based food and beverage session, I think two years ago. And again, it was in response to retailers asking us to, to help them find more products to source in that category. Yeah. I do feel like plant-based has become a little bit like some other uh, uh, attributes where you know gets a little out of control like mm -hmm. um you know peanut butter yeah okay it's plant-based right yeah it's always been plant -based. well kind of like natural you could call anything yeah. natural it's right. like here's this plant-based lettuce yeah. and then all of a sudden <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, by. that gets into kind of a whole new territory with mm -hmm. you know claims product claims you know mm -hmm. gluten-free non-GMO, plant-based, you know, you end up with like 10, 10 attributes on the label. So, mm -hmm. And then it's, it's, there are so many different things that a product can be. And, and then you have new certifications and, you know, coming out all the time. Yeah. Well, you see that for sure, like in uh, protein, you know, with uh, seafood, you know, there's multiple certifying organizations in seafood and then, um, you know, the egg, the egg situation is going to be interesting. Cage free, free range, you know, just that's coming up pretty quick. The mm -hmm. cage, you know, everybody's going to be cage free here before long, but then, you know, cage free doesn't really mean no cages, you know? So there's like, yeah. that's a whole nother the food industry is amazing. You know, it's like the, a lot of nuance in different areas. So. Actually, somebody had a, a question that's related to food processing. Let's see. How challenging has it been for food processing, processing companies to recover consumers' confidence in its products after COVID positive cases within its food facilities, resulting in temporary closures, so on and so forth? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's been difficult at all. I don't know that the average consumer is uh, monitoring the news that closely mm -hmm. to, to see that... Um, a particular plant somewhere had a few people test positive and they temporarily closed, but then they brought it back online. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it kind of comes back to like a the issue of trust in a brand. Mm -hmm. you know? So if I trust Hormel brand products, um, yeah, maybe they, sh maybe, and I don't want to use them as an example necessarily, but because, you know, I, but there were a lot of companies in food processing that had uh, instances of, of people testing positive and then feeling compelled to disclose and then bringing that facility offline and doing some remediation to make sure it was clean and quarantining. You know, so, I, you know, I think most companies are trying to do the right thing and they're well-intentioned and mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think that really had an effect in my mind. Cool. I have one very specific question, which I think I can kind of provide an answer for. Okay. Uh, somebody uh, asked about is premium roasted cashews uh, with F, I guess this is a certification, FSSC 22,000, gluten-free, peanut-free, GMO-free, protein-packed, directly on the source, a trending product for 2021. I can't answer whether that specific product is trending, but I do know that free from products are trending uh, along with the whole wellness thing that we were talking about. Uh, for anything that's allergen free, uh, GMO free, those things yeah, yeah. are always trending, right? 
Yeah, I mean, anything, anything clean label, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's common sense. Do you want a product with a whole bunch of ingredients you can't pronounce, or do you want yep. one with, with butter and 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 salt? You know, some stuff that you know. Yeah. You know, so I think, given push come to shove, people are going to lean toward something that that they can recognize and make sense of. Yes, and the other thing I want to relate to that specific person is you have a lot of things there that would make for a good story in your marketing, right? You're packed directly at the source in Mozambique. Uh, you know, so you have a lot, you have the clean label, you have, you know, you, you're packing it directly at the source. You have a, it sounds like you have a good story there behind yeah. it that you can use in your discussions with buyers. You know, I think sometimes the story to you, the story to tell to buyers is a, is a good story for the buyer, but isn't, mm -hmm it's harder to translate to the shopper, you know, because, you, you know, you get limited real estate on a label, mm -hmm. but the buyer wants to know that you're, um, you know, you're especially like, let's use an example like coffee that, you know, that it's fair trade, that, um, you know, the conditions that it's harvested under those type of things, the, you know, the retailer wants the assurance from the supplier that you're doing the right things because you know you're I'm putting your product in my store and, you know so they they've got to hold you to a higher standard than ever before mm -hmm. because of the of the of the risk you know like if you if you put some bad peanut butter in my on my shelf that uh, you know isn't what you say it was or or a video you know I mean we see this a lot you know, I think we just had an example this week with, or maybe it was last week, but, uh, you know, there are food activists out there that will, you know, get jobs at different facilities and make little videos and put the, put the video out there and it serves their agenda mm -hmm. and shows a, the company in a, maybe a negative light. You know, it's just kind of the, one of the new issues that we deal with in modern society that didn't we didn't have before <clears throat> yeah definitely well we have one more one final question then we got to wrap up because we are just about out of time uh ken uh it's, again it's a specific question but he said given the current conditions what advice would you give a new natural frozen meat uh meals snacks and treats brand launching in the pacific northwest and northern northern california this spring so I can only relate to you some things that I've heard in, in speaking with people in the industry as far as it is tough when you're launching a new product in these situations, right? You can't do sampling in person, you know. So you, the, your best thing is to work with your retailer to find really interesting ways of promoting your brand and getting that brand in front of their consumers. Uh, and whether it's, you know, online, digital, social media, you know, uh, uh, sending out mail sampling programs, you know, there's find unique ways to get those, uh, that trial among the consumers, given the restrictions that we all have. Uh, anything you want to add? Yeah, I'd need to know more. I'd, okay. I'd, I'd want to better understand the product and the unique attributes and, 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 you know, and then formulate like your answer is good, but I, I, I just feel like I'd want to know a little bit more because yep. depending on the product, there might, you know, you might have an aha moment and be like, oh, you guys ought to do this, mm -hmm. you know, because there's so many, like, it's never been easier to build a brand and come to market. Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, the infrastructure, the hurdles that you used to have to run through to try to get an appointment with a buyer, like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. compared to now, you, can, you, you and I can start a brand on the internet this afternoon and then build it up through social media. And then I... I attend a ECRM event and meet with a bunch of buyers and boom, I got distribution and I'm off to the races. Yep. Yep. I go. can't disagree with you there. All right. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, Mike. Thank you for your insights. Uh, always glad to chat with you. Yeah, and you. Um, we will have this, this is recorded. So we will be sharing it with everybody afterwards. So everybody have an awesome day. Thank you.